Okay, yes, thank you very much for joining me this evening and thank you to Andrew, Sir Keith and the organising committee for the honour of the opportunity to speak to you this evening about TAR the Trauma Audit and Research Network and its impact on acute trauma care over the last 30 years. Um, so uh, here are my declarations of interest. And in considering the impact of TARN, the Trauma Audit and Research Network, I'm going to consider four elements, the nature of the TARN data itself, how the TARN data has been analysed, how this analysis has been used by hospitals, regulators, commissioners and NICE to improve patient outcomes and in many ways to transform the kind of trauma care that we provide, with constant reference to the resources that have been needed to make this happen and to key individuals. Um, so with that in mind, I'd very much like to organise some of the key people in supporting organisations and please forgive me if I've left anybody out, but at the beginning I'd like to very much pay tribute to my colleagues on the TARN Executive, Antoinette, Laura, Tim and Dushi, uh, current members of the TARN team, too, too numerous to mention, but I've mentioned some of the senior members here, our statistician Omar Boomer, I'm going to be presenting a lot of his work, uh, previous TARN staff. David Yates and Marilyn Woodford, very much the parents, the creators of TARN, who had the idea and turned it into an international organisation. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, all the hospitals who've contributed data and resource to TARN over the years, with the support of the Department of Health and NHS England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and latterly from the National Organisation of Clinical Audit in the Republic of Ireland. So in order to understand the impact of the TARN data, it's important to go back to a time when there was no TARN data. Hard to imagine trauma, trauma care in the NHS without TARN data, but in fact, you only have to go back 33 years to 1988. Uh, and the gentleman in this slide, some of you who are as old as me will recognise him. It's Professor Sir Miles Irving, my former consultant colleague at Salford. And in 1988, he was chairing the College of Surgeons Trauma Committee, and he was asked to look at the quality of trauma care in the NHS and he had no credible data. So what did his committee do? They pulled out post-mortems on a thousand trauma deaths and found their hospital care records and found that a third of them could have been prevented by better care and made some very sensible recommendations to improve care at that time, developing paramedics, ATLS, improving trauma care and rehabilitation. But many things did not happen straight away. However, what Sir Miles and his committee had the uh, insight to realise that this was not adequate credible data. There needed to be a better approach to data that underpins an important clinical service. So he recommended that we start out with the UK Major Trauma Outcome Study, similar to the US Major Trauma Outcome Study that Howard Champion had started at the Washington Hospital Centre. So David Yates and Marilyn Woodford picked up the baton and created TARN. Uh, and when it became clear this was not just a study, but it was a network, MTOS became TARN in the mid-1990s. So what is TARN? TARN is a patient registry. And if you look on Wikipedia for the definition of a patient registry, it will tell you that a registry is an organised system that uses observational methods to collect uniform data on a population defined by a particular disease, condition or exposure, and this is followed over time. That's fine, that's all well and good. To me, this tells you absolutely nothing about what TARN is about. To me, a registry that actually impacts on patient care is a collaboration of healthcare providers that wish to compare patient data, care data and outcome data in order to do benchmarking and research to generate improvement. So the key words that I think embody TARN over the last 30 years are collaboration, comparison and improvement. And that's what I hope to demonstrate to you over the next half an hour. So an important characteristic of a registry that make them very efficient for quality improvement, quality assurance and research is that they collate, code and model existing hospital patient data. They don't need to measure new variables on patients, so no direct patient contact is required as long as the acquisition of that data is ethical. How can it be made ethical? Well, it's ethical if the central database of the registry contains no patient identifiers, and that's true of TARN. So we have, although we have NHS number with permission from the Health Research Authority, we store age and not date of birth. But the records can be pseudonymized to go back to the patient records for updating at each hospital. It's also ethical if the hospital is then using the reports, the quality assurance and quality improvement reports, to improve the trauma care service at that hospital. And that's what 
hospitals use TARN reports for. So ethically, then, we don't have to approach individual patients for consent, which means the whole process of acquiring data for TARN is, is not resource intensive, as, as we would do if we had to ask patients for consent. But we do apply the NHS digital opt-out. So registries need consistent inclusion criteria, and we're still using the same inclusion criteria pretty much as we were when we started out in 1988. And they are the same that we use by Howard Champion in the US Major Trauma Outcome Study. So it's any injured patient arriving at hospital alive. We don't have pre-hospital deaths. And then one of four markers of severity has to happen to that patient. They either need to stay for three days, they need to go to critical care, they need a transfer for ongoing acute care, or they die during the acute care phase. So if a patient fulfills one of those criteria, they will go on to TARN, as long as that is also accompanied by an injury that inherently has life-changing potential. So the vast majority of patients on the TARN database will have one of the injuries on the left-hand side of the screen. On the right-hand side of the screen, patients with these injuries in isolation will not get onto TARN, even if they stay for more than three days or, or if they die, uh, because most of these injuries are not inherently life-threatening or life-changing, other than hip fractures and burns in burns units, and they have their own separate registry. Registries also need secure uh, methods of acquiring data and reporting data and we started out on paper-based forms. Some of you might remember the old yellow and blue forms but since 2005 we've had a secure web-based electronic data collection and reporting system, the EDCR, and you can see some of the landing screens on this slide. On the right-hand side some of the key uh, TARN core variables about the incident, date and time of arrival, whether or not uh, the patient received a trauma team attendance, etc. Uh, here are some of the patient variables that can be recorded by the hospitals, but as I said, we don't see things like name and address centrally. And on the left-hand side of the screen is the patient's pathway through the different parts of the hospital. And within each of these locations, the TARN data coordinator can enter which people saw the patient, which interventions were conducted, what the vital signs were, and what the investigations were. And then we record the outcomes, such as length of stay, survival to hospital discharge, complications, etc. The trauma registry also needs an accurate way of measuring the severity of injury. And the international classification of diseases is not optimal for that. It's very good at telling you which structure of the body was injured, but not the severity of that injury. So since its inception, TARN has used the abbreviated injury scale, which was developed by AAAM in the United States in 1970. We're using the 2008 upgrade of the 2005 version of the dictionary, soon to go on to the 2015 version. And the beauty of AIS is that every single injury is coded on TARN and given a severity score from one for minimal injuries, such as a fractured finger, to a six for a maximal injury, such as a brainstem laceration. And once you've coded every single injury and given it an AIS severity score, you can identify the highest score in each of six body areas and from the three most severely injured body areas you square those scores and you get the injury severity score such as this unfortunate multiply injured patient with the subdural hematoma splenic laceration and fractured femur who gets ISS of 41 out of a possible maximum of 75. I love this picture it's from the TARN research committee from about five or six years ago um, and you will see there Marilyn Woodford, very much the mother of Tarn, sadly retired now because of ill health, uh, and David Yates here, the, uh, the father of Tarn. And it's very much very lovely that uh, David still joins us as our senior fellow on the research committee. And you'll also recognise Antoinette Edwards, our chief executive officer, and some of our excellent analysts that many of you would have worked with over the years. And what Marilyn realised when measuring the AIS and the ISS is that if we left hospitals to do it individually on their own trauma care cases, and there'll be variation in the way that the AIS and the ISS was measured. So what Marilyn did was bring in trained injury coders into TARN. So we don't allow the hospitals to code their own injuries. This is all done centrally through the TARN injury coders that will code injuries in a reliable and reproducible way. And this is important when we're comparing hospital performance. This does mean that the data collection for TARN is more resource intensive, uh, but in fact that investment in getting the injury coding right, the dialogue 
between the TARN data coordinator in the hospitals and the TARN injury coder in the co coordination centre in Salford generates interest in the data and interest in the output from that data. Which brings me on then into the key resources that are needed in the hospitals. And in fact, this is where most of the resource of TARN lies. It's not in the staff in the coordination centre. Uh, yes, that does cost a sum uh, that's significant each year, but in fact, most of the resources of TARN are the data coordinators in the hospitals. And this is a full time job in a major trauma centre, approximately seven to nine hundred trauma cases per annum, even more in some of the large NHS major trauma centres and a part time person in the trauma unit. And the clinical leads for TARN in each of the hospitals are absolutely vital to ensure that, um, that the queries can be answered by the data coordinators concerning the patient's injuries from the TARN data coordinator and also to receive the TARN reports and, and to act on them. So once we've got this fabulous system for collecting data, how should we analyse it? Well, this is uh, too important a job to be left to one person, even the young picture of David Yates that was shown here. Uh, the, the analyses that TARN conducts are decided on, upon by the Audit and Research Committees as part of the TARN exec, which Antoinette Edwards chaired, and presented to a wider community of trauma stakeholders on the TARN board. And we have representation from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, Orthopaedic and Trauma, Society of British Neurosurgeons, Royal College of Anaesthetists, Paediatrics and Child Health, College of Surgeons England and Rehabilitation and Medicine, Healthcare Commissioners, Patient Representatives, uh, the ex-Dean of Shah, uh, my our alma mater is all, also contributes. So with that set, set up and structure for TARN, we can remain independent of the Department of Health, although NHS England does have an observer role on the TARN board, and it's very important that they are aware of uh, how TARN is planning its analysis and dissemination of information. So from an idea in 1989, TARN is now the largest European trauma registry with over 200 hospital members. We have 100% of trauma receiving hospitals in NHS England, Wales, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and some continental European major trauma centres. So what analyses does TARN produce? Many of you on the call will have received reports on your hospital's data from TARN. Uh, this is decided upon by the audit committee and this slide shows you some of the audit filters. I hope it's projecting okay and it's not too small for you to see. But what I'd like, also like you to notice about this slide is the novel format, TARN Analytics, Microsoft Power BI, that we're rolling out to hospitals to make their own data even more accessible. And what you can see is a dial for each of the dashboard measures, which gives the percentage for each particular uh, characteristic. So this is data quality. And the black bars are the national average. So you can see that this hospital's data quality is pretty good, just below the national average, with BOAST 4 compliance for open fractures. It's compliant for 42% of its cases, slightly below the national average, and so on. These comparisons to other so the national norm can be made for tranexamic administration for bleeding patients, for consultant presence in the resus room, for ISIS over 15, or for triage positive patients, for hospital transfers and airway timings and CT scan timings for major trauma patients and the completion of rehabilitation prescriptions. So uh, the TARN team centrally are rolling this out, doing, doing a great job. We've had fantastic engagement from the hospitals. And you can see here, that uh, this is displayed on the TARN Analytics as the opening screen. Uh, it can be, you can then toggle onto a navigation pane, there's help boxes, you can see data from more than one hospital if you're allowed to have access to that. And you can select the timeframes that you want to compare and also the dashboard measures that are useful to you. From the navigation pane, you can drill down then into different data sets, um, head injury if that's what you're interested in, children or older people. So this makes the data far more interactive. However, what a lot of people use the TARN reports for, and I would call this the money shot, is to look to see whether their uh, survival rate is as expected and how it compares to other hospitals. So this is what we call a caterpillar plot. And on the y-axis here, we have the excess survival rate. Um, so that's the observed minus the expected survival. And as you might imagine, the average is 0%. And each hospital is a green dot on this screen with 95% confidence limits. This is anonymized reporting, so the, uh, the hospital looking at this will know that this is its performance, but it won't know who the other hospitals are. You can see that the top 10 hospitals get 3% more survivors than you would expect. 
the bottom 10 get 3% uh, less survivors. And although most hospitals' confidence limits over, overlap, which suggests that survival performance to discharge is similar, some hospitals are significantly better than the norm, 95% confidence limits not overlapping zero, and some hospitals are significantly worse than the norm. How is this excess survival rate generated? Well, this is where the audit and research arms of TARN are symbiotic. So what we do within TARN is we create a survival probability for each patient, depending on those patient characteristics that can't be altered by the trauma care system. Uh, and there are six characteristics, the patient's age, their gender, and their interaction. Gender itself doesn't predict your likelihood of survival, but older men do do better than older women, so there's an interaction with age. We also take into account the injury severity score, as I've described, the patient's pre-existing medical conditions, and the Glasgow Coma Scale. And this is a different survival prediction model to TRIS, which is what Howard Champion was using in the Washington Hospital Centre, and, and fits a European trauma data set in a much better way. Um, and if you want to look at the probability of survival of your injured patient, there's a link at the bottom of this slide, and there's a PS calculator. So from each injured patient's probability of survival, we get a figure of between 0 and 100%. And if you add up all the percentage um, probabilities of survival and divide by the number of patients, you get the hospital expected survival rate you, you subtract that from the observed survival rate, and that's how we get the excess survival rate. And we conduct a further standardization in town to compare each hospital on the national case mix. Uh, and if anybody wants to look up the papers that have underpinned that model, the PS model, led by Omar, our statistician, then, then here's the, uh, the link here at the bottom of the slide. And we update the model every couple of years, and recalibrate the coefficients, uh, depending on the more recent data as we've seen improvements in trauma care over time. So we've been doing the Caterpillar plots for a long time. Um, so this is a slide from 2005 and 2006, and I'm showing it to you just to highlight TARN's outlier procedures, how TARN uses this um, survival surveillance to pick up hospitals that aren't doing very well and to safeguard patients. So back in 2005, 2006, we found this hospital at the bottom here, that had 10% less survival than you would expect, and we were very worried about that. Uh, the hospital didn't come forward and tell us who they were, and at that time, our reporting was anonymised. So we approached the then Healthcare Commission, which, which were the precursor of the Care for Quality Commission, and they told us to break the code and approach that hospital and go in and check its data. And that's what we did. We found that this hospital uh, was a rural hospital, uh, it couldn't get patients with severe traumatic brain injury into the local neuroscience centre, so it wasn't its fault that it was having less survivors than predicted. And by making this link, uh, we were able to encourage the local neuroscience centre to, to open eight new critical care beds, which then meant that this peripheral hospital could get the severe traumatic brain injury patients transferred into the neuroscience centre, and the outlier status no longer exists. And to me, this is a really important function of time, safeguarding patients, picking up outlying mortality performance before it becomes headlines in the Daily Mail. One of the things that the Care Quality Commission did say to us, though, is this anonymised reporting of trauma survival has to stop. So since 2007, uh, on our website, on the performance comparison, any member of the public or any of you can look up the uh, excess survival rate for any hospital uh, in the NHS that's a member of TARN, if you wanted to go and look at that after this talk and see how your hospital is doing. Since we've been the official national clinical audit for major trauma, the Care Quality Commission charges us with uh, outlier surveillance, and we tend to use a funnel plot for that rather than a caterpillar plot. And we look at hospitals that are more three or, three or more standard deviations with better or worse survival than you would expect. And the first role that we have in TARN is, is not to comment on the quality of trauma care, but to check the accuracy of the data. And the first thing that we do is check whether or not that hospital has sent in all their trauma cases over that time period. So we look at hospital episode statistics, apply a TARN filter to it, and work out the number of trauma cases we should have seen from the hospital over that period of time, compare that to the number of trauma submissions, and we get the percentage case ascertainment. So when we do an outlier inquiry with a hospital, that's the first thing we're looking at with that hospital, whether or not their data is good or not. 
one of the things that we have discovered over time is the impact of hospital transfers on whether or not a hospital is an alarm outlier, three standard deviations worse than the norm. This is how we normally report trauma outcomes in our funnel plot. And you can see the hospital in red is a negative outlier. It's getting more than three standard deviations less in the way of survival than we would expect. And so if we just use this uh, funnel plot, we would call this hospital an alarm and we would have to launch an alarm inquiry. But it, uh, in this way, we're allocating survival to the last hospital in the patient's chain for, for patients that are transferred. And we call this right censorship. But if we look at trauma outcomes in a different way, and for transferred patients, we allocate the live died outcome to the first hospital in the pathway, we see this hospital is no longer an alarm outlier. It's between two and three standard deviations, and it's an alert. And if we take out transfers altogether from the funnel plot, then the hospital is also an alert. So we would no longer now call this hospital an alarm outlier, and we will only investigate hospitals that are alarms on two out of three of these different ways of looking at trauma outcomes in terms of censorship. So these are all outputs from the TARN research strategy, which I present to the board every year of updating the model and making sure that we're doing the outlier surveillance accurate, accurately. Uh, on the vast majority of occasions, outliers uh, arise from data quality issues, but occasionally we do have to encourage hospitals to involve the Care Quality Commission. And although hospitals that we have referred in the last couple of years can be a bit prickly and defensive at first. I think in the end, they're quite glad of the process and find it's a learning process that improves patient care. The second element in the TARN research strategy is to observe and identify effective systems of trauma care. And this is uh, one of the areas in which TARN has been very successful and probably our most high profile uh, publication of this was made in the Lancet in 2005 with the Society of British Neurosurgeons. So we looked at the 180 or thousand patients that we had in the database at that point. And we were looking at the uh, impact and care of head injury or traumatic brain injury. And we found that TBI was only present in about 16% of major trauma patients, but they were younger, uh, 10 years younger, more likely to be male, more severely injured, more often needing a transfer, but had 10 times the mortality of patients without a head injury. But despite that, when we look at the risk adjusted odds of death over time, the odds between 1989 and 2003 had improved less for patients with head injury than they had for patients without head injury who have a much lower mortality. So we were interested in the reasons for that and we did a logistic regression analysis and we found that only, a th only two thirds of patients with severe traumatic brain injury were getting uh, neuroscience care, either as the first hospital or as a hospital that you could be transferred into. So one third of patients with severe traumatic brain injury never went near a neurosurgeon or a neurocritical care specialist. And practicing at that time, it was common for me if I was practicing as, as a registrar in a hospital that you would refer to the neurosurgeons and they wouldn't have a critical care bed, and if the injury was diffuse, they wouldn't accept that patient for transfer. And what we showed from this research is that these patients were twice as likely to die than they would have been if they had been accepted for transfer. So this was a really important use of our large observational data set with risk adjustment and survival prediction modelling. And from this paper, the NICE Head Injury Guideline in 2007 made a recommendation which I think has changed trauma care throughout the UK and throughout Europe, that all patients with severe traumatic brain injury should be transferred into a neuroscience care, even if they don't need a neurosurgical operation. So we then looked on TARN to see what happened after that. Um, my then clinical lecturer, Gordon Fuller, and he published those results in the British Journal of Neurosurgery. And from 2003 to 2009, what you can see is this green bar which is the proportion of patients with severe traumatic brain injury who got no neuroscience care, reduced from 33% to 19% in a six year period. So a higher proportion of patients with severe traumatic brain injury were getting that crucial specialist neuroscience care. And what this resulted in was a halving of the case fatality for traumatic brain injury between 2003 and 2009, uh, which is really important as I showed the very high mortality 30% that these patients had on the database at that time. And this is before even the inception of our new NHS England trauma networks. 
a use of the TARN data to inform a high impact publication, to inform a national guideline, which then the TARN data was used to show the impact of that guideline and benefits to patients. Uh, within TARM, we were able to do research on the uh, efficacy of NHS trauma care and continue to show deficits in trauma care. Uh, the specialist care is also very important for patients with severe pelvic fracture, and we did that research with Peter G. Nudis um, and the British Trauma Society. Um, Gordon's subsequent research showed that even in 2009, between 20 and 30 percent of severe TBI patients would not get specialist neuroscience care. And we compared the outcomes on TARN to international colleagues uh, to the Victoria State Trauma Registry and to the, uh, the, the trauma centres in Helsinki and we found that patients in those systems were, were likely to do better and more likely to survive their acute care than patients in the United Kingdom. So with that weight of evidence and with the NCPOD report, better care for the severely injured, we finally arrived at proper systems of care for trauma patients, our trauma networks for adults and children within NHS England which have uh, recently also started in, in Wales and Northern Ireland. So uh, we were duty bound then within TARN to uh, research how effective our new trauma systems had been. And this is the strobe diagram from our 2018 uh, Lancet Clinical Medicine publication, looking at the efficacy of trauma system rollout in terms of changing the care pathways and outcomes for patients. And we concentrated on this number at the bottom, 110,000 hospitals over 110,000 patients rather over a 10 year period in 35 hospitals that have been members of TARN continuously from 2008 to 2017. And what we looked at within each quarter was the excess survival rate in those 35 hospitals. And what you can see in this interrupted time series, again, the excess survival rate on the y-axis and the calendar date on the x-axis is between 2008 and 2012. There was no real pattern in the excess survival rate, uh, but, but on D-Day, uh, 1st of April 2012, when we started with the new trauma systems, there was an immediate step change in the excess survival rate, albeit quite small, and then a slow incremental but gradual and inexorable rise in the excess survival rate over the first five years of inception of the trauma network. And this is only in, in the, the uh, 35 hospitals. If we look to all hospitals on TARN at any point, there, there is some confounding from differential membership over time, but similarly, you can see this step change followed by a gradual improvement. So the new trauma networks in NHS England have undoubtedly saved hundreds of lives. We are very grateful to the Emergency Medical Journal for publishing uh, several research papers from TARN in December 2015 to celebrate the 25th anniversary of TARN. And one of the very important papers led by um, a key uh, figure in trauma care, Jason Smith and Tony Keogh in the Southwest, was the changing face of major trauma in the UK. And what Tony and Jason had noticed was that the average age of major trauma patients was going up very fast. It was 36 years on TARN in 1990. It was 40 years in 2006, but there had been a massive jump from age 40 in 2006 to age 54 in 2013. Um, again, because of the, the TARN hospital membership changing over that time, Tony and Jason checked on hospital episode statistics, trauma ICDs, and could see the same thing. So within TARN, older people's group led by Mark Baxter, um, with analysis by uh, Marisol Fragoso Neguez, we looked to drill a bit deeper to see if we could understand the reasons for this massive aging of the population in town between 2006 and 2013. Was it due to the aging of the population? What this graph shows is the percentage of the English and Welsh population in the oldest four decades of life between 2005 and 2014. And in fact, that's only increased by 2% over that time period. So that didn't explain the massive aging of the trauma population. What does explain the aging of the trauma population over that time period is the, the NICE head injury guideline, uh, opening access to CTs, particularly CT head scan. And what you can see in this slide is the percentage of time patients who got a CT or an MR scan. And th these are patients uh, over 65 in the red bar 
And you can see that back in 2004, uh, about 12% of them were getting CT scans on TARN. Fast forward to 2013, and it's over 60%. So a five-fold increase in, in the rate of CT scan, a three-fold increase for, for younger adults. And we think it's that increasing use of 3D imaging, which has meant better detection of major trauma and particularly is responsible for the aging of the TARN data set over that time period. Recently, uh, we've done research with Will Erdley in the Northeast and Jan Dixon, and that was published in Age and Aging last year. And we've been looking at the trauma pathways within the new trauma care systems because the new trauma care systems were very much designed around high energy trauma, uh, the military model, but with so much trauma occurring from low energy falls in older adults and understanding that their physiology is often normal at the scene of injury and they were triage negative, we wanted to understand how the new trauma systems were, were treating these patients and what it was delivering for older adults who were injured within the new trauma care systems. And this pie chart shows the pathway for adults aged over 65 years. And what you can see is that 59% of them solely receive care in a trauma unit, 27% receive care in a major trauma centre, uh, but that's usually because it's their nearest hospital. And a very small percentage, only 9%, will get a subsequent transfer from a TU to a major trauma centre. So what this actually means is that the major trauma centre and the trauma systems are focusing in a fundamentally different way from how we envisaged that they would do when they were set up through, dis through our discovery of this uh, low energy trauma, older academic, uh, older epidemic, uh, we now understand that two thirds of major trauma will go to a trauma unit as a first hospital rather than a major trauma centre. A small proportion of that will then get a secondary transfer, but only a third of major trauma actually arrives directly to a major trauma centre. We've looked again on TARN to see about how the uh, ageing of the population is continuing. Uh, and this shows the uh, age between 2006 and 2013, and then between 2014 and 2018. Uh, and on the y-axis, we've got patient age. And what this actually shows you, and Omar our statistician did this analysis, is the average age of a major trauma patient aged uh, with ISS 15 and greater is now 60 years old. And drilling down to the mechanism of injury, the most common mechanism of injury in the NHS for a patient sustaining major trauma with an ISS of 15 is a fall from a low energy height. And the majority of these patients are going to be triage negative at the scene. We've also uh, been looking at the impact of COVID and lockdown on the volume of major trauma. And this is ongoing work from the TARN analyst team. And what you can see here, the uh, upper brown line is the volume of uh, TARN trauma arrivals in 2019 and the blue line in 2020. And you can see an immediate 50% reduction associated with the first uh, lockdown. Uh, I think this uh, lower blue line here is an artifact as we are pending more TARN submissions here. But we are looking closely at the impact of the pandemic on the volume and type of major trauma that is being seen. And the fourth element of our research strategy is to support uh, studies that collect data that isn't collected within TARN, randomised trials funded by NIHR and other funders. So we're supporting a range of investigations, the MATS study, uh, Reboa randomised controlled trial, Cryostat randomised controlled trial, the ORIF trial, uh, Robbie Foy's study looking at the impact of national clinical audit run out of Leeds, and Tim Archer, who has a, an excellent grant from the Health Foundation, to look to see how we can predictively model the major trauma, trauma proms program that Antoinette has led, which is separate to the main TARN program because we obtain consent to follow up patients after six months. Uh, so that work is ongoing and is all being supported by TARN data. And as I've mentioned before, we have international collaborations with nearly all, well, I would say, with uh, all the major trauma registries internationally in North America, Australasia, and Europe. Um, and we have publications with the Victoria State Trauma Registry and uh, with the German Trauma Registry as well. I really must at this point pay tribute to the other members of my research committee, which I've listed on here. We meet every month and we look at new proposals that come in from investigators. If you're a member of a TARN hospital, 
you can pitch a research proposal to us and we'll help you if we can with analysis uh, or a data set. All the details are, are on the TARN website. Uh, but this team does an excellent job of making the TARN data as available as possible to investigators and ensuring that in the future, TARN research will continue to shape trauma care. But one of the things I would say to you is it takes a while to grow research from a trauma registry. This is a number of publications by year, and you can see in the first 10 to 12 years of TARN, there weren't many publications, but it's gone up exponentially since then. So when you're setting up a trauma registry, and I'm, I'm talking now to, to international colleagues who might not have a trauma registry in their country, what you need to do is set up your trauma registry for immediate feedback on the quality of trauma care with the dashboards and reports that I was showing you earlier. That's what the hospitals invest in TARN data for, so they can get immediate comparisons to their peers. If you wait for everything to be reported in a research paper, we all know that sometimes it takes up to a year to get a paper into a journal and there's no guarantee of publication. And it's like asking this crowd that have come to see a football match to wait uh, until next year before the game actually appears. So make the data good enough for quality improvement. In my opinion, it will be good enough for significant and high quality research. So to summarise the impact of TARN on major trauma care over the last 30 years, what I would say is that TARN is now the largest European trauma registry. We're providing quality improvement and quality assurance for our member hospitals. We're providing high impact publications. Our outlier procedures safeguard patients within hospitals. Our research has informed recommendations of the National Institute of Clinical Excellence and NHS commissioning, which has resulted in halving TBI case fatality. It's resulted in us understanding the impact of the new trauma systems and understanding that now most major trauma is caused by a low energy injury and we need to do further research to find out how we can best serve these patients going forward. So the key building blocks for TARN success are the efficient registry methodology, the training that the TARN team provides in engaging the hospitals and that engagement, that, those vital conversations between the TARN data coordinators and the injury coders, which create interest in the data that's collated. So that, that relationship of, of coding and validation is absolutely crucial. A clear research strategy informing TARN reporting to hospitals and also creating high impact publications. And the leadership that the key individuals and my colleagues over the years that I mentioned earlier on have shown. I think that most of all TARN is a tribute to the community of practice and their commitment in investing in TARN over the years. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I've really enjoyed speaking to you this evening. And um, I think we can now open up to questions, Andrew, if that's uh, okay with you. So I will stop sharing.